Hi everyone, my name is Maria Molina and I'm currently an advanced study program postdoctoral fellow at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. I would like to acknowledge my collaborators on this work, David John Gagne and Andreas Prime, both scientists at NCAR. Today I'll be sharing some of my postdoctoral research, which has focused on training a convolutional neural network to perform a classification task of thunderstorms. And we care about classifying thunderstorms because there is a subset of convection that has a greater likelihood to produce severe hazards, which in our case include tornadoes and large hail. And many different physical variables and parameters have been found to help with their identification and prediction. But one variable that has been found to be very useful for identifying storms more likely to produce these severe hazards is updraft helicity. And updraft helicity takes into account the ver vertical velocity of winds, which gives us some information on the strength of a storm's updraft and vertical vorticity, which is the spin in the atmosphere. A stronger rotation implies that a storm is more likely to be a supercell, a morphology that has more frequently been associated with the production of severe hazards. Now, in past studies of severe storms that use high resolution model output, certain fixed thresholds of updraft helicity have shown good performance for identifying these storms that are more likely to produce these severe hazards. And in these examples that I'm sharing here, we're considering a threshold of 75 meters square per second squared. And so for the example that exceeds that threshold, we can see a more organized structure associated with that storm. And the example that does not exceed that threshold that's below it, we see less organized structure. And so less organization suggests that that storm would be less likely to produce some of these severe hazards. Now, while these thresholds are helpful, they do fail to generalize. For example, there may be some storms that fall just below that threshold, but still have some supercell structure to them. And we can perhaps improve on this limitation by training a convolutional neural network to perform this classification task using these thresholds or heuristics as labels. And the benefit of using a CNN with several layers is that we can learn different level features of storms that could perhaps provide useful information. And by using heuristics as labels, we can bypass the need of having to hand label a large number of examples. Now we can spend a lot of time tuning and training a model to perform a classification task, but what happens when it encounters an extreme event? And as the climate continues to change and we face more extreme outlier events, what will happen to the model's performance in those cases? But perhaps more important is knowing why a model is able to perform well or not. What are the physical reasons for the decisions made by our model? Model simulations that we use for the study were created by the NCAR water system program using WERF at four kilometer grid spacing. There is a historical and a future climate simulation. Here we can see a visualization of them. The historical climate simulation is on the left and it was created using ERA interim data, which is a reanalysis product and that was used for initial and boundary conditions. And then the future climate was also initialized using ERA interim but with an added climate perturbation that was derived from a set of 19 CMET5 models using the RCP 8.5 greenhouse gas concentration pathway, which is just a very high baseline emission scenario. And something that you'll notice with these two simulations is that in our future climate, we do have greater water vapor content, but the large scale flow is generally very similar between the current and the future climate simulation. And that's because large scale spectral nudging was applied to keep the large scale pattern um, in line with the boundary conditions, um, but there is still some flexibility in that threshold that was set. So our thunderstorms do change from a thermodynamic perspective and to some ex extent spatially and temporally. Now, storm objects were extracted from both of these climate simulations using the watershed method, which consists of three steps. First, storm cores are identified. In this case, we use 40 dBZ as our maximum threshold, which is just a quantity derived from um, some simulated radar and provides an estimate for precipitation intensity. Then following that, uh, we go ahead and grow out these objects to a minimum intensity, which we denoted to be 20 dBZ. And then we save these objects as patches that contain some of the surrounding information uh, surrounding the storm, which we assume to be influential for their upcoming classification. Now, we did not train our models using simulated radar reflectivity from the model output. We trained them using 20 environmental variables that we extracted matching each of our storm objects. These include the following variables listed here, 
and these were interpolated onto four different vertical heights. So one, three, five, and seven kilometers above ground level. Then following uh, the extraction of these environments, I went ahead and split up the data into two groups, a training and a testing set split at 60 and 40%. And then these were standardized by subtracting the mean of the respective population and then dividing by the standard deviation. So here is the architecture of our deep learning model. We applied three two-dimensional convolutional layers with an increasing number of activation maps that decrease in spatial extent due to max pooling. And then after that, we flatten our data and we pass it through two dense layers. ReLU activation was used after each one of these layers with the exception of the final dense layer where we applied a sigmoid transformation. And we did that uh, to extract values that are between zero and one, which we can um, uh, use as information as um, an estimate to the probability that our storm is either strongly rotating or not. So values closer to one, we consider to be strongly rotating and values closer to zero, we assume to be non-strongly rotating. Now, a benefit of these layers is that the um, earlier activation maps show low level features of our data and later uh, future maps show more complicated features in our data. So we went ahead and trained our model only using the current climate simulation data. And this were, these were 13 years uh, in the months of December, January, February, March, April, May. And then we evaluated using the future climate that is unseen. And this is an estimate for the late 20th century. And we end up with um, two classes, strongly rotating storms or non-strongly rotating. But within those two classes, there will be some incorrect classifications. And so those are our false alarms when our model thought it was a strongly rotating storm, but it was not, and then misses when our model thought it was not strongly rotating, but it indeed was. Uh, and important to note is that we have a large imbalance in our data set. Uh, most of our examples are not strongly rotating storms. So for evaluation, it was really important for us to consider metrics that were not heavily dependent on true negatives. So we really focus on those strongly rotating storms or the misses. And so here we have a performance diagram. We have success ratio on the x-axis, probability of detection on the y-axis, contour showing critical success index, and these diagonal dashed lines show bias. But importantly, just to um, what we're seeing here is that these curves are our model with varying probability thresholds, and this is their performance. And we can interpret this plot as curves that are towards the top right show good performance. The red line is the future storm objects. And then the purple shows a subset of the future climate, which are outlier storms. And we chose those based on storms that had the very high end moisture content. So exceeding the 95th percentile of low level moisture. And so we see very good performance for both of these cases in the future climate, but why? And so one way we can ask the why is by using permutation feature importance, where we shuffle one input channel or a variable in our case, and we evaluate the model skill. So we focus on critical success index as our evaluation metric. And on the left-hand side, we have our future climate storms or the outliers, and results were very similar for both of these uh, subsets of storms. We see that kinematic variables were identified to be the most important for um, good performance in our model. And that makes sense because our label data was created using a draft helicity, which is a rotation measurement. But on the right-hand side, we see something interesting that happens. If we take an unseen, uh, an unseen set of current climate storms and perform permutation feature importance, we actually get our third most important variable to be a moisture variable, even though it wasn't used in that creation of the label. And so this tells us something very interesting, which is that maybe that ver moisture variable is important for our current climate storms, but perhaps our model uh, learned to ignore it when looking at storms that lied outside of that moisture distribution. And if we use a different um, evaluation metric, in this case, Breyer skill score, um, which considers some of the underlying distribution of the data, we see something even more interesting, which is that that same moisture variable now is showing up as the third most important variable in our future climate and outlier cases, but is the most important in our current climate. 
So this further suggests that our model is able to reprioritize some of these input channels based on what their magnitudes are uh, and possibly um, also reduces that sensitivity to outliers. And uh, this is what makes our model be able to remain skillful. But we also wanna consider now some of the spatial features or spatial aspects of our data. And we wanna evaluate our, store, our model in that way. And so for that, we can use saliency maps, which specifically plot the grading of the predicted outcome from the model with respect to the input. And so in this case, I am sharing some saliency maps from a correctly classified example. And the saliency maps show zonal and meridional, and meridional winds. So in the X direction and in the Y direction, and we see something that resembles a storm mesocyclone. So these gradients plotted here, uh, we can refer to point in the direction of our data, meaning red colors are positive gradients and for U winds in, on the X direction are from west to east. And then the respective directions for uh, the Y axis winds. And so this makes a lot of sense because the patterns look like storm mesocyclones, which is great. It means that our model is identifying something physical. When we consider a, saliency, a set of saliency maps for wind patterns of true negative events, we see that the CNN identified broader areas that were not organized. And for mirroring on the winds, we actually winds, see winds generally going from south to north, which suggests some inflow towards this less organized convection, which checks out also uh, in the real world. But what about when the model got examples wrong? And so here we have some false alarms. Um, and this is a, an example where the updraft helicity value was just below the 75 meters square per second squared uh, value for updraft helicity that we denoted. And we see that spatially, the model still identified regions of strong rotation, but classified it as a strongly rotating storm because updraft helicity was just below that fixed threshold. And if we go ahead and bin and create this histogram, of um, frequencies of updraft helicity values for all of our false alarms in the study, we actually see that most of them were indeed higher values of updraft helicity, but just below that threshold. So this is valuable because um, it shows us that our model learned something and is still identifying strongly rotating storms, um, even if they fall just below that threshold. Now for our misses, um, here we find that most of the failures occurred when the feature of interest, in our case, uh, strong rotation, was located near the edge of the storm object. And so here we again have histograms, but this time in the spatial um, extent of our storm objects. The yellow shows higher frequencies of these maximum values of updraft helicity, most of them occurring in the edge of the storm patch for our misses. If we look at the same histogram for HITS, so correctly identified strongly rotating storms, most of the time that was towards the center of our storm object. So this is likely the reason why our model in this case is failing. Even though spatially with our saliency maps, we see that it still found um, some strong rotation near the center of the storm. And so to conclude, um, just three highlights here is that we have learned that our deep learning model can perform well even when faced with extreme outlier events um, that are associated with this classification task. We know that there is some physical, uh, some physical features that were learned uh, from our convolutional neural network and that it can actually also learn uh, using some heuristic data or perhaps in more advanced cases for other um, weather or climate examples that um, use expert systems to create labeled data. Maybe uh, this can be a very useful application for those um, detection um, um, tasks at, as well. And um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. That was great. Um, so we have, we have a few questions here and we have some time. So, um, we, one of the questions was, is, is there any way to quantify, this is, you know, the one that we all get, is there any way to quantify the number of extreme events that are needed in your training data set? So again, this question of how much data do you need? Hmm. Um, I guess I'm not sure how much data I need. Um, in an earlier iteration of, um, this model, uh, where I actually considered training using balanced data. 
So I thought that this highly imbalanced data set where most of the events were not strongly rotating and only a small subset were strongly rotating would pose a problem for our model. Uh, so I went ahead and artificially balanced the data set to have an equal amount of strongly rotating and non-strongly rotating storms. And this really decreased my sample size. Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head what that percent decrease was, but it, there was still some very good performance um, there as well. Um, so I don't know how many are needed. Um, as far as for our test data set, we have close to or in excess of 400,000 um, examples. So if you can think whatever 60% is, um, like, yeah, uh, there were quite a few examples. So over 500,000 for training. Great, thank you. And you have other questions, but we're gonna save those for the panel at the end. So don't go anywhere. Okay, great.